Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maya Luria with TMC for Seniors. And yesterday we got to start off and kick off our heart month. And today we're going to continue on with heart failure causes and treatment. I've got Dr. Greg Kushkari in here with me, and he has done some wonderful presentations for us. And so I'm really excited that you're here today to talk about heart failure because we have not had a talk in quite some time on that on that topic. But before you start, Dr. Kashkiri, and I just want to share with everybody what they what they should know about you. So, um, you know, you have I, I love to share because you've got such a great background. You graduated from Stanford for your undergraduate degree and received your medical degree from Yale University School of Medicine. Dr. Kashkiri completed both an, an interventional cardio, cardiology fellowship and a general cardiology fellowship through Georgetown University Medical Center, as well as completed a heart failure fellowship through Columbia Presbyterian Medi Medical Center. He, Dr. Kashkiri is with Pima Heart and Vascular, and he treats patients with all forms of cardiac disease, including coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and other arrhythmias, and valvular heart disease. He evaluates symptoms that are potentially cardiac related, and he believes that preventative care is important for all patients. Welcome, Dr. Kashkir, and how are you today? Good. Thank you very much, Maya. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you here and talk to your group. Great. So we do have an online audience that's watching from home. And I, you also have an in-person audience. So if you're watching from home, please feel free, if you've got any questions that come up, to leave those in the comments, and then we'll ask those afterwards. I'm going to go ahead and put your um, PowerPoint up for you so that you can go ahead and get started. All right. Thanks very much. And thank you all for coming out today. I'm looking forward to talking with all of you. Um, as Maya said, we're going to talk about heart failure which is kind of abbreviated CHF, which is congestive heart failure, diagnosis, causes, and treatment. Um, I had actually, I, I treated heart failure for 30 years in, in cardiology, and it's one of the most common things that we deal with as cardiologists, but I've actually never given a lecture on the whole topic and found as I was putting this together that there's a lot of things to talk about. Um, I will also tell you that just about the same time that Maya asked me to give this talk, uh, one of the um, attending physicians that ran healthcare asked me to give a heart failure talk to residents. So I've, I've put together uh, this talk with kind of both audiences in mind, although I modified it specifically for this group. But there may be some things that are a little bit more technical and biological than maybe you're used to seeing, and I won't spend lots of time on it, but. For some of you, that will be an extra insight that, that you might not usually see in these types of talks. No, I, I lost my hearing aids, and I realize that now i got to leave because I can't hear a damn thing. I'm sorry to hear that. So I've, I've put my name up here. I actually also put my website up here. And uh, not to be... Uh, I lost my hearing aid. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh. Um, I have a blog that I've been doing for the last three or four years. So there are actually a lot of other topics you can read about if you're if you're interested uh, by going to gregkoshkarinmd.com. All right. So in our CHF talk, we're going to discuss what it is, um, how do we diagnose it, how do we categorize it, and then the causes and treatment. And the causes and treatment will kind of combined together because um, it will just flow better to be discussing uh, aspects of treatment when we talk about those causes. Now, con congestive heart failure or heart failure is a very scary term, and this is the look I sometimes get on my patients' faces when I tell them that they have this, and uh, it is certainly not a benign condition, um, but it's also not as quite as serious as it sounds, because people imagine their heart has stopped, it's about to stop, they're about to die. Um, and failure, unfortunately, is, is probably not the best term for congestive heart failure, because the heart hasn't completely failed. Um, the definition that we use for congestive heart failure is 
an inability of the heart to pump enough blood to meet the body's physiologic needs in an efficient manner. So in a sense, it's heart in inefficiency. The heart is not doing quite what it should be doing, and other systems uh, kind of get activated to compensate for that, and it leads to some of the symptoms and signs of heart failure. So heart failure is an inefficiency of the heart. It's not doing things as efficiently as it should, but it doesn't necessarily imply that your heart is about to stop or has completely failed. Now, this is one of the biological slides, um, but it's, I think it's an important thing to show people because it, it helps explain what the most cardinal feature of heart failure is, which is fluid retention. So if any of you have ever been told you have heart failure or know people have heart failure, you might hear uh, your doctor referring to, oh, you're retaining fluid or you have too much fluid or you're fluid overloaded. And why does fluid overload have anything to do with heart failure? Um, if the heart's not pumping, it's often not pumping blood forward. Why does that lead to, um, to there being too much fluid in the body? And the answer has to do with this, this sort of biophysics pr principle that was discovered decades ago uh, called the Starling curve. And that is that the heart is a pump, but it has other properties that make it like a slingshot. So you know with a slingshot, if you pull the slingshot further, you project something farther. The heart is like that also, so the heart's pumping, but as it relaxes, if, if you push it out further, it will generate a bigger pump, a bigger oomph. And so when the heart is, um, is not pumping enough blood, one of the mechanisms the body has to try to get the heart to pump out more blood is to retain fluid, because on this axis is the, is the pressure going up, and the pressure goes up when you retain fluid, and that makes the heart pump out more blood. So vertically is higher cardiac output. So that is why our body has these mechanisms to retain fluid in order to help the heart pump more blood, and that's called the Starling mechanism. Um, the problem, of course, is that that occurs at a certain at a certain consequence that we'll talk about. In addition, it's not it's not an indefinite upward slope here. As you retain more and more fluid, the Starling curve starts to flatten out, such that you're not getting much more bang for your buck when you retain more fluid. But still, that's how our bodies are programmed to deal with the uh, with the state of the heart not pumping out as much blood as it should. Any questions about that before I? Go on to the next slide. Yes, ma'am. Right atrial pressure. So on this particular slide, it's referring to the pressure on the right side of the heart. But this is equally true of the left side of the heart for what would be the left atrial pressure. Good question. All right, so let's talk about the symptoms of, of heart failure. The most prominent symptom is shortness of breath. And shortness of breath occurs partly from this Starling mechanism, because as you raise the pressures on the left side of the heart, those pressures kind of are transmitted back into the lungs, because the lungs drain blood into the left side of the heart. So if the pressures are higher in the left side of the heart, they are also higher in the lungs, and fluid can then leak out into, uh, into the spaces of the lungs and make them a bit stiffer and not as easy to move, and that correlates with the sensation of breathlessness and being short of breath. Uh, fatigue is another symptom. We think of fatigue more as, as a sort of forward symptom, meaning the heart's not pumping out as much blood forward, and so the body is feeling fatigued. The muscles aren't getting as much blood flow as they want, um, and other organs don't, and that correlates with a symptom of fatigue. Swelling in the ankles, higher up in the, in the calves, um, sometimes in the abdomen area. All of those are signs of fluid retention uh, for, for this condition. And finally, lightheadedness can be a symptom, most commonly due to the heart not pumping enough blood to generate a good blood pressure, so low blood pressures can lead to a person being lightheaded. So these are the most prominent symptoms of congestive heart failure. And by the way, I'm going to use the terms CHF, congestive heart failure, heart failure interchangeably. They all, for all practical purposes, mean the same thing. Now, then there are signs. So what's the difference between a symptom and a sign? 
A symptom is something you tell your doctor. A sign is a, a sign is something the doctor notices on examination. So when the doctor is examining patients, um, they look at the neck. There are there are veins in the neck called the the uh, jugular veins that can kind of protrude out, uh, and you can look. Sometimes you can actually even see the little pulsations, and it actually is almost like a barometer. It's like you can measure the pressure by how high those little pulsations are. So that gives a doctor an idea of whether the pressures are elevated or not. Um, it, when the doctor listens to a person's lungs, if there is fluid that is it is sort of seeped out into the into the spaces of the lungs, you can hear that as something called crackles or rails. Um, listening to the heart, there are heart abnormalities. There are extra sounds that can be heard in congestive heart failure. Heart murmurs aren't necessarily a sign of congestive heart failure, but they can be a sign of why a person has congestive heart failure, because heart murmurs can be a sign of a valve problem. We'll talk a little bit later about valve problems. Um, so not only do, do we use the exam to try to diagnose heart failure, but we're also using it to try to find out why a person might have it. And similarly, we can listen to the heart and hear the rhythm. We can tell if the heart rate is fast. We can tell if it's irregular. Um, some of you might have heard of a heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation, which again, we will talk about later. Atrial fibrillation tends to be fast and it tends to be irregular. So we can sometimes, even before getting an EKG, we can tell from listening to a person that hmm, this person might be in atrial fibrillation and that could make a person have congestive heart failure. Um, examining the abdomen, we can sometimes detect uh, signs of fluid retention by the liver being enlarged or the spleen being enlarged. And finally, we look at the legs and look for signs of swelling there. So these are all, most of the signs at least that we look at to diagnose heart failure and try to determine why a person might have it. Then there, are, then there are tests that we do. So we've done our hi history and learned. Yes, ma'am. Um, is it just one sign, one symptom, or is it more than one? In terms of making a diagnosis. Making a so, diagnosis. so one symptom by itself or one sign by itself doesn't make the diagnosis. And, and not because there's an arbitrary rule that we need two or we need three. It's that most signs and symptoms can also be caused by things other than heart failure. So for instance, swelling of the legs can also be caused by vein problems in the legs. Shortness of breath can also be caused by lung problems. And so you, we don't make the diagnosis just from one thing. It's a constellation of, of signs and symptoms along with the tests that we're about to talk about. So one of the tests that we always do is an EKG. Um, there's various things we can look at at the EKG. We can look at how tall the spikes are. Um, we can look at whether there's these uh, patterns called Q waves that could end indicate a previous heart attack. Um, we look for signs in a part of the EKG called the ST segment that can mean ischemia. But the bottom line is we can look at the EKG, get some idea of, hmm, might this be a person who has underlying uh, blocked arteries um, or signs that the heart has become enlarged. These are things that EKG can help tell us. Um, there are labs that can be helpful. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here other than to mention one in particular because we use this a lot. It's called a BNP or a pro-BNP. They're kind of two versions of a, of a similar type of protein that we can measure. Interestingly, when the heart is stretched, it releases this substance, BNP, into the bloodstream. And the substance itself, BNP, is actually good for a person with heart failure. So it gets released because it helps get rid of fluid and it does some other good things. But the fact that it is being released is a sign that there are elevations of the pressures and stresses on the heart. So it's kind of a paradox. BNP is a good thing, but it's also a sign of a bad thing. You know, think of it this way. It's like um, if you, um, uh, let's say you had an unsteady gait, you might have a walker. A walker is a good thing because it helps keep you from falling down. But if you see somebody with a walker, you conclude, hmm, I guess their balance isn't as good as it should be. And finally, we frequently get an echocardiogram. And echocardiograms are the most, probably the most helpful test in making a diagnosis of congestive heart failure and, and determining why it is, because we can see how the heart pumps, 
We can see how it relaxes that systolic and diastolic function. We can see how thick the walls are, how big the heart is. We can look and see if there are leaky valves or valves that don't open as well as they should. And we can sometimes draw conclusions about uh, the pressures inside the heart, um, as well as other, other aspects of, of the heart. So an echocardiogram gives us lots of information. Did you yes. mention murmurs? I said that murmurs are things that we can, that was on, on the previous slide, uh, that murmurs can give us reasons why a person might have heart failure. There are a lot of different ways we categorize heart failure, and I don't want to go into all of these in great detail, um, but only to explain how we look at it, and also because you might have heard some of these terms before. So one of the ways we categorize heart failure is by symptoms. Another way is through stages, and stages are mostly used by doctors for kind of research purposes and for, um, for demographic purposes. I don't think it's as practical a means for a day-to-day -day purpose of, of your understanding heart failure. Um, we also categorize heart failure by whether it's more related to the heart not pumping well or more related to the heart not relaxing well, systolic and diastolic heart function, and there's various, various ways we categorize that. And we also categorize it by acuity. So we can say a person's in acute heart failure or they have chronic heart failure or they have kind of a combination. They had chronic and now they have acute on top of that. And that, that brings me to a point that I think is also important. People often say, well, will I always have congestive heart failure? And I, or I feel fine, why are you still telling me I have congestive heart failure? So unless a person who has had heart failure has a completely reversible cause. So let's say they've done well all their life, They um, go into the hospital for a surgical procedure and the surgeon writes an order to give the person IV fluids, but they get double the amount they should and somebody forgets to turn it off and now they've got way too much fluid in their body and they're quote incongestive heart failure. And it's realized that fluids are stopped, the fluid has gotten rid of with, with diuretics and this person might never have congestive heart failure again. But for most people who have an episode of congestive heart failure, they have some condition, some, some process in the heart or, or structural abnormality that will always make them have a tendency to congestive heart failure. And even if we use medicines and lifestyle changes to make it unlikely a person ever has congestive heart failure again, we still say to that, that that person has chronic congestive heart failure. Whereas acute congestive heart failure is what we say when we say a person is in congestive heart failure right now. That means they're actively retaining fluid or having symptoms from congestive heart failure. So I think that's an important uh, thing to distinguish. This is the one categorization I will go into a little, a little bit more detail because we, we use it so frequently um, conversationally and also in our notes and it might help you understand what these mean. So we talk about New York Heart Association classification of heart failure, where one is a person who has had congestive heart failure but has no symptoms whatsoever. Um, class two, they have mild symptoms. There, there are some things that they're limited by, but mostly they're not limited. Class three patients tend to be a lot more limited. Um, they can't do anything more than very mild activity without symptoms. And class four is much more serious symptoms where their symptoms are at rest or with any activity at all. And people can go back and forth in, in, in these, uh, in these uh, classifications, these classes. All right, so lots of causes of CHF. Um, I am not going to list all of these right now. You've got them in your notes there. We're gonna to touch on these as we go uh, into the next part of the lecture. And before we do that, any more questions about what I've talked about so far? Okay, let's dive in. <coughs> All right, so ischemic heart disease I am covering first. Ischemia means compromised blood flow to the heart. It usually means blockages in the coronary arteries, which are the arteries that supply the heart with blood. And it's the, probably the most important thing to rule out in a person who has uh, congestive heart failure because A, if you treat the blocked arteries, you can, you can sometimes 
reverse the, the heart failure. And secondly, if you don't treat it, if you overlook that a person's in congestive heart failure because of blocked arteries and don't treat that, that can lead to a much worse prognosis um, because those people can be uh, at risk of having heart attacks and worsening congestive heart failure. Um, I'm going to decide how much of this to, to go over, but I will briefly, for those of you who have an interest in physiology of, of ischemia, which as I said is compromised blood flow, one of the things that people are often surprised about is that the, the, the part of the heart cycle, pumping and relaxing, that is dependent on energy is not the pumping, it's actually the relaxing. So if you interrupt blood flow to the heart, the first thing that happens is it gets stiffer, not that it stops contracting. And interestingly, that, that also correlates with something else that people often think is, oh, if my heart function is diminished, isn't that just a normal thing of getting older? And the answer is no, our pumping ability is, should be completely normal throughout our lives, barring something that has injured the heart. Whereas it is pretty natural as we get older for the relaxation of the heart to get worse as we get older. So our heart does get stiffer as we get older. And that kind of goes along with this, this relaxing being more susceptible to decreases in blood flow and energy and, and that. Did you get your hearing aids? <laughs> yes. no, <Literally>. okay. yeah. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Um, so that, that's just a little information about ischemia. When we are suspecting ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease, one of the tests we do is echocardiography. So an echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart, and we can look to see if there are parts of the heart that don't move as well. So if you imagine a group of people that have diminished heart function, where the heart's not pumping as well, some people it's global, all of it doesn't pump as well, and some people, Parts of it look, move fine, parts of it don't move fine. Since the blood flow of the heart is kind of regional, there's an artery that supplies this part of the heart, another one that supplies this part, another one that supplies this part. If one of those areas isn't working and the others are, there's a, there's a much higher chance that there's a blockage in that artery that supplies that part of the heart. Now, it is possible to have blockages in all the major arteries and have all the heart muscle not be working very well but again, if you see regionality to the dysfunction of the heart, that is an indirect sign that there may be blocked arteries. So we use this as a clue that that might be an issue. Um, nuclear scintigraphy or nuclear stress tests are looking at blood flow to the heart. You don't see the arteries, but you see whether the heart's gaining a good blood supply or not. If it is not gaining a good blood supply, that again is a sign of a block, blocked ar artery either in several or, or one. Um, some people get MRIs, and MRIs can actually see if there's a scar. Um, I've had patients where I do an ultrasound of the heart, and it looks like a part of the heart isn't moving well, um, but the images aren't real good, or sometimes on a nuclear stress test, the report will come back that there's a scar there, um, but the scar is questionable because the heart muscle seems to be moving, but the nuclear study is saying there is scar. An MRI can be the definitive test to say, yes, there is a scar, no, there is not a scar, and can rule that in or, or, or rule that out. And the gold standard for making a diagnosis of blocked arteries is coronary angiography. So that can come in two forms. We now can do CAT scans that are angiograms and see the arteries. Um, it's a little less accurate, but less invasive than a cardiac catheterization where the catheter is actually put in the heart, dies, injected in the arteries, and then we can see if there's narrowing or not. So these are the kinds of tests that we use to determine if a person has coronary artery disease. And once we know that, we can try to open up arteries or revascularize people, give them new vessels. The most common way we do this is with stents. Um, this isn't a stent talk, and, and so I'm not going to go into lots of detail about the process of opening up vessels with stents, but I thought it would be interesting to look at stents, and, and because I'm sure almost everybody here has heard of stents, and not everybody has seen them. So this is a stent that's off the balloon. This is a stent that's on the balloon. The stent starts off with a 
crimped on the balloon that is not expanded. So this is expanded. This is what a stent looks like when it hasn't been expanded. And when the balloon is blown up, it gets embedded in the artery. The balloon is deflated and removed, and the stent stays in the artery in this expanded state. Stents are, in a sense, like scaffolding. Imagine you've had a, a mine shaft that has collapsed, and you and you rebuilt the, the girders and beams and helped prop up the walls that have collapsed. That's what a stent does. What yeah. is that made of? Um, it, different kinds of things. Um, chromium, nickel, cobalt. I think, I'm not sure stainless steel is used anymore, but I think the original ones were. It's generally, the, the properties you want from a stent are high tensile strength, meaning that it resists being crushed and it can help to hold things open, but you also want it to be light um, so that it's easy to maneuver through vessels. And so they've done a lot of work over the years to try to find op, um, optimal alloys for, for stents. Do you ever have to remove them? You can't remove them. No. Once they're once they're embedded, it wouldn't be possible. I mean, you, you you'd have to open up the chest, and even then, you'd have to then slice open the artery because this is on the inside of the artery, not on the outside of the artery. Yeah. So it becomes kind of part of the wall of the vessel. The only time we remove them is if they if actually the deployment fails. So like rarely, very rarely, the stent will sort of fall off the balloon, and it'll have to be retrieved. Because then it hasn't been it hasn't been expanded. But once it's the balloon is blown up and it's embedded in the vessel, it stays there, doesn't migrate after that, and and eventually the 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 um, body forms a protective layer of cells around it. It just becomes part of the ball of the vessel. All right. And the other major way that we revascularize people with blocked arteries is with open heart surgery. So open heart surgery takes a a vessel. Uh, this is blue, but it should be. It should actually be red. This is what's called the internal mammary artery. It comes off of the arm artery, the subclavian, and it's usually used to bypass. Up here's a blockage, and it bypasses the blockage. That's why it's called bypass. It. It's like if you had a a um, a kind of messed up road and you build another road around it. That's what bypasses are. This is a vein that is plugged in on one side to the aorta, and on this side. To the artery distal to this blockage. So this person has had two vessel bypass surgery. All right, so the next category that we most want to immediately rule out, in fact, it's actually easier to rule out than the than the blocked arteries because the blocked arteries ultimately you might need an angiogram, but we can rule out valvular heart disease with a simple echocardiogram. Um, there are four major valves in the heart, two on, one, two on the left side, two on the right side, and every valve can have the same type of problem. It can either not open well, we call that stenosis, or it cannot close well, and we, we call that regurgitation. So in theory, there should be eight different types of valve problems, but three of them are very uncommon in adults, um, and I listed the other five in rough order of frequency um, that cause clinical problems. So you can have the mitral valve not closing well, mitral regurgitation. You can have the aortic valve not opening well, aortic stenosis. Those are the top two by far that cause problems like congestive heart failure. Um, and each of these valves can leak or not open um, aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis. And finally, on the right side of the heart, the main right-sided valve problem that, that can cause issues in adults is tricuspid regurgitation. So I've got a, a little video here so you'll see what mitral regurgitation looks like. And we will see if so left atrium mitral valve and the mitral valve is closing. And that prevents blood as it's going out of the heart into through the aortic valve from going backwards. But if the mitral valve doesn't work right, you see it's not closing here. And this purple represents blood that is going backward. And that's mitral regurgitation. And it causes two main problems. One is that some of the blood that's supposed to be going after the body is going backward toward the lungs because the left atrium eventually connects back up with the veins that drain blood from the lungs. 
So if the blood's not going out, out as much, it can lead to a lower blood pressure, it can lead to fatigue, um, and the symptoms of what we call sort of forward heart failure. When the heart is pumping blood backward toward the lungs, it raises the pressures in the left atrium and the lungs and can make people short of breath. So those are the cardinal symptoms of, of mitral regurgitation. So how do we fix mitral regurgitation? One is to do open heart surgery and put an artificial, artificial valve. And I just showed some pictures of valves. Um, this is a mechanical valve and this is a biologic valve. I can't tell from this if it's a cow or a pig. Um, this is actually called a homograft. This is from a cadaver. It, you can take humans who've, who've passed away and remove the valve and then uh, denature the protein. So if, if you put a um, one person's valve on another person, it'll tend to be rejected. Um, most, most programs don't use... How did I get way over there? Most programs don't use these. You have to have kind of an organized center that harvests these valves and treats them appropriately. So most people get biological valves, get this type of valve. And I'll talk about this one in a subsequent uh, talk. So replacing the valve is one way of treating mitral regurgitation. Another way is to do something with catheters. And the most common catheter procedure is called a mitral clip. And the mitral clip looks like this, and a catheter is put up through the leg, eventually into the heart, across the septum, into the left atrium, across the valve, the mitral valve that's not closing, and then it is deployed on the leaflets. It kind of pinches the leaflets together. So it, it keeps them together so that it's not regurgitating as much. Now, the downside is it also leads to the valve not opening as well. So one has to balance putting in this to keep them from leaking with not keeping them from opening fully. Um, you can actually put in more than one of these. So sometimes people get one, sometimes two, <clears throat> rarely three. But the more of these clips you put in to help the leakiness, the more chance you have of keeping the valve from opening adequately and causing mitral stenosis. So we don't. We generally only do one or two of those. But it offers an option for people with leaky mitral valves who are too high risk for open heart surgery, um, an option that we didn't have 10 years ago. Aortic stenosis, the other very common um, valve problem that can cause congestive heart failure. As you can see, in a, a nice normal aortic valve has thin leaflet edges and opens nice and big. When you have aortic stenosis, the leaflets get thickened and calcified and, and stiff and less mobile, and the opening goes down. And so the heart's not getting as much uh, output of blood. And like we talked about before, that will lead to a kind of a mechanism of fluid retention to try to make the heart pump out more blood with the coexisting swelling, shortness of breath, and things like that. So when we think about ways of fixing aortic stenosis, we go back to our artificial valve, so open heart surgery with a uh, mechanical or cow or pig valve. Um, this is an interesting looking valve. This is a mechanical valve, but it's attached to this long sleeve. Some people with aortic stenosis, um, and also aortic regurgitation for that matter, also have enlargement of their aorta. And so people can sometimes do a procedure all at once where you not only remove the bad valve, but you also put this longer sleeve into the aorta so that to, um, to get rid of the aneurysm or at least isolate the aneurysm from outside the bloodstream. So that's a special kind of procedure that's a lot less common than just straightforward replacing the aortic valve. And then TAVR you've probably heard about. Again, something that we were probably just starting about 10 years ago for people that were not candidates for open heart surgery. And this is basically a bioprosthetic valve on a stent, a very large stent, because valves are a lot bigger in diameter than, than coronary arteries. And it's deployed with a balloon, and it's blown up here, and it replaces the previous valve. And so this has allowed a lot of people who had aortic stenosis and were too sick to have surgery to have their aortic stenosis fixed. Over time, 
this procedure has been tested in people at lower and lower and lower risk, such that a lot of people that are candidates for open heart surgery are still now candidates for this less invasive procedure. And for any given person who needs uh, their valve done, we have a what we call a heart team. So hema heart and vascular, we have structural heart cardiologists who do things like mitral clips and tabbers, and we have surgeons who do a open heart surgery, and a person who needs to have uh, something done with their valves will meet with both to determine what's the right thing for that particular person. All right, hypertension is probably the third most common, and I shouldn't say third most common in the sense that it's less common than the other two, but it's just third in my list of things to discuss with you. Uh, so high blood pressure can cause congestive heart failure. When the, when the blood pressure is high and blood pressure, and by the way, I'm gonna take a step back one second. A lot of people come to my office with high blood pressure and are worried they have a heart problem that the high blood pressure is a sign of a heart problem. And high blood pressure is not a sign of a heart problem. The heart is not what makes the blood pressure high. There's all sorts of things that make the blood pressure high, and the heart is very, very low down on the list of causes. The brain makes the blood pressure high by, by stress and other things, sending out signals that constrict the vessels. Uh, the kidneys make the blood pressure high by retaining fluid to raise the blood pressure, salt and fluid. Um, the endocrine system through hormones and things, they can raise the blood pressure. Um, you know, a lot of it is just your genetic predisposition. But having high blood pressure itself is not a sign that you have a heart problem. But high blood pressure can cause a heart problem, and thus we cardiologists are often very involved in trying to control high blood pressure and see a lot of people with hypertension. And the way hypertension causes heart problems is that the heart is now pumping against a higher pressure and that leads to increased stress on the, on the wall of the heart. And the way that the heart normalizes that stress is it thickens. So there is, um, there's a physics principle called Laplace's law that has to do with how uh, pressure is translated into tension, um, but without getting into much detail, by the heart muscle thickening, it can normalize the tension on the walls of the heart. Unfortunately, when it thickens, that also tends to make it stiffer. So it takes greater pressure to fill the heart with blood. So it's a little, it's a little uh, counter, uh, counter active to itself. Um, it, in other words, it sets, it sets itself up for other problems. But again, that's the way we're biologically programmed. You know, a lot of things that happen to the body during cardiovascular problems are based on things that in evolution were beneficial for short-term stresses because high blood pressure, um, blocked arteries, these are not things that cavemen had or hunter-gatherer societies had. Um, their biggest risks were getting attacked by a lion or, or something else and bleeding. And so most of, these, most of these things we talk about is how does the body respond to such things are, are ways that the body developed to try to deal with a temporary problem that either prevented a person from dying or didn't work. And if it did prevent a person from dying, the stress went away and those mechanisms went away. But in our modern society, the things that stress the heart are generally chronic things. So the heart has these chronic activation of systems. So high blood pressure eventually leads to diastolic dysfunction, the heart not relaxing as well as it should, being stiffer, and fluid retention and the symptoms of congestive heart failure. So treating hypertension is, is a very important thing. In fact, even if it's a valve problem or, or blocked arteries or virtually anything else, control of blood, blood pressure is very helpful, very important for people with congestive heart failure. How am I doing with time? All right, I'm not going to go into all the, these other causes right now because there's a lot of them. It's, it's more that I wanna make the point that there are other causes that the doctor needs to think about because diagnosing them can lead to specific treatments for these particular conditions. There can be infections, there can be genetic causes, there can be problems with the lining around the heart called the pericardium. Um, there are increased adrenaline states like overactive thyroid, 
um, a tumor of the adrenal glands that make too much adrenaline, uh, so-called broken heart syndrome or Takotsubo. There are toxins that affect the heart and stopping the toxins is, is paramount. Um, women at, at the end of pregnancy can develop heart failure for, for mechanisms that haven't been completely elucidated, um, but it's felt to be some sort of potentially immunologic reaction against some of the uh, the proteins coming you know from the fetus since they are also coming from the father who is not biologically related to the mother most of the time um, there's such a thing as high output failure and that's kind of seems counteractive i i just said earlier that heart failure is initiated by the heart not pumping out enough blood so how can you have too much output and still have heart failure one of the things that's true of all forms of high output failure is that the increased output isn't being used in an efficient way. So many of these states lead to shunts where the, where the blood is bypassing the tissues. So the tissues aren't getting enough blood flow, even though, though the heart is pumping out enough blood globally, it's kind of shunting or bypassing the important places and again, activate systems to retain fluid. And finally, we, we usually think of heart failure as a left ventricular problem, the, the, the pump that pumps to the body, but it can be a right ventricular problem also. And I'm going to skip over this other than to show you some pictures. So heart, can, heart muscle can often get enlarged when it's not contracting well, and we call that a dilated cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy just means an ill heart, think of it that way. Um, the heart can be abnormally thickened in certain conditions. Um, high blood pressure can lead to thickening, but some people have a genetic predisposition through, um, through a, literally a single gene mutation that can lead to marked thickening of the heart muscle. We call that a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, sometimes we read about young athletes who die suddenly. This is the condition that they have. And then there are things called restrictive cardiomyopathies, uh, which lead to the heart pumping well, but the heart muscle gets stiff, so it pumps out less blood, and it takes more pressure in the atrium to fill the heart, um, and that leads to, to uh, shortness of breath due to the fluid in the lungs. <clears throat> All right, so now we're going to turn to more general treatment. We, we talked about already talked about treating the underlying cause because um, each of the things we discussed about its causes, I talked about how we treat that. Um, but now I'm going to talk about um, how we sort of generally treat all forms of either diminished heart function, systolic dysfunction, or diastolic dysfunction. And then I'm going to finish with just a couple slides on a condition called amyloidosis. All right. Don't be intimidated by this slide. Um, I put this up because I want you to know that if you have impaired heart function, impaired systolic function, where the pump isn't pumping as well as it should, there are a lot of medicines that can help and improve. And in fact, we think of there, there being the four pillars of heart failure. And the four pillars include beta blockers. That blocks adrenaline, because adrenaline actually can injure the heart over time. So. This goes back to my discussion about being attacked by a lion and you're bleeding and, and adrenaline levels go up to support the circulation. And once you heal, the adrenaline levels go back down again. But if you have heart failure and diminished output, the adrenaline levels are always elevated and they are actually further injuring the heart. So beta blockers are used to, to counteract that. Then there's another system that gets activated, the renin-angiotensin system. And there's three kinds of drugs for that. There's ACE inhibitors like these, there's ARBs like these, and there's a drug that got developed about 10 years ago called Entresto, which has the, the uh, generic name Dalsartan Secubitrol. And these all block the renin-angiotensin system, um, to, to, which, as I said, can also injure the heart over time. So these are the first two pillars. The third pillar is a system that blocks what are called mineral corticoids. So there's a a hormone called aldosterone, and aldosterone causes its own problems with the heart. It causes more fibrosis, more stiffening, more fluid retention, and there are drugs that can block that system, 
and the most recent uh, addition to our armamentarium are called SGLT2 inhibitors. They're actually medicines that were developed for diabetes. The, oops. the two that are approved are Jardians and Farsiga. And I'll tell you a very quick story. Um, 20 years ago, it was discovered that Actos and Avandia, which are effective for helping to control diabetes, they found after it had been released that they were finding more examples of congestive heart failure in people who use them. And so first, these drugs were given a black box warning, do not use if you have congestive heart failure. So anybody in here is on Actos or Avandia and has congestive heart failure, ask your doctor, is there an alternative for my diabetes? But the other thing that happened is the FDA mandated that all new diabetes medicines had to be tested and be, be, to be uh, ensured to be safe for the heart because the most common thing people with diabetes die of is cardiovascular disease. So, so if you lower the sugar, but you raise the risk of heart disease, you're not doing a person with diabetes a lot of good. So they had, they had to be tested. What they found in these SGLT2 inhibitors was they were safe for the heart. Not only were they safe, but when the, the people who were on the SGLT2 inhibitors had about a 30% less likelihood of developing congestive heart failure. And so the drug companies who made this said, hmm, we got a pretty good thing going here. I wonder if this might be beneficial to even more people than just people with diabetes. And they did the appropriate studies. And it turns out, yes, if you put non-diabetic people with heart failure on these medicines, it also decreases heart failure. And so they were, in the last few years, approved for congestive heart failure. So those are the four, um, four main pillars. Now there is a fifth pillar, hydralazine isosorbide, that is not used as broadly because it hasn't been shown to be beneficial in most Americans. But in people who are African American, um, it actually is beneficial. And there's various theories as to why blacks might be, uh, might benefit from this drug more than others having to do with just the particular properties of these drugs and how that might be different than the, for the genetic makeup of most people of African descent. Um, but be that as it may, we do use this combination uh, in the form of Bidil in people of, uh, who are African American and have congestive heart failure. But it hasn't been shown to be beneficial outside of that group. So these, that's our armamentarium. Other things that are important to consider are decongestion. So I told you fluid retention is kind of the sine qua non of congestive heart failure. We have to use diuretics to get rid of fluid. Loop diuretics like Lasix are the most common, but there are also thiazide diuretics like metolazone and hydrochlorothiazide that we use. Uh, there's another drug that we sometimes use called Corlinor. It slows the heart rate down. Some patients who are on beta blockers either don't tolerate it because they lower the blood pressure too much, um, but they still have a high heart rate, and it's been found that the high heart rate itself isn't good. And if you slow the heart rate down with this drug that does not have blood pressure effects, that can be beneficial. It doesn't improve lifespan, so it's not considered our first-line therapy, but it is definitely a good second-line therapy in people who remain symptomatic and have an elevated heart rate. And finally, there are a lot of devices that can be beneficial. And I'm going to go over these in, a, in the following slides. So this is an ICD, and, um, and uh, it's basically a car cardioverter defibrillator, intracardiac cardioverter defibrillator. And this lead in the right ventricle looks for, it's sensing abnormal electrical activity like ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and if it sees it, it delivers a shock to get a person out of it. So ICDs can be life-saving. They don't they don't change the heart function, though. They don't change congestive heart failure. Um, mostly they're passive. They sit there and they watch. Um, but they can still save people's lives. Uh, they, uh, and, and the fact is that if you have diminished heart function, you are at higher risk of having these dangerous uh, heart rhythms. So they're very important for preventing what we call sudden cardiac death. And then we have um, something to treat an, a condition that is often seen in people with congestive heart failure, um, many have something called a left bundle branch block. And that's an electrical phenomenon where the electricity going down the two main electrical pathways goes more slowly down one than the other, and it leads to dyssynchrony. 
And so I'm going to show you a little video of what that looks like. So see how this wall is not moving at the same time as this wall. The part's more doing this than this. And again, you can see it here. This one's moving away when this one's moving in. And we call that desynchrony. And that is, can be caused by a left funnel branch block. It can also be caused by a regular pacemaker. So people who have complete heart block get a pacemaker. It activates the heart in this abnormal way. For most people, that doesn't have much of an effect. Um, and many people with pacemakers don't pace often enough, like need their pacemaker often enough for it to have this effect. But for those who are pacing all the time and develop heart dysfunction from it, what we can do is put another lead in. So the usual pacemakers have two leads, one in the atrium and one in the ventricle, the right atrium and the right ventricle. But for people who have a left under branch block or heart failure uh, either brought on or exacerbated by a pacemaker, a third lead on the opposite side on, in the left ventricle can restore synchrony. And we call that cardiac resynchronization therapy or CRT. A more recent device that uh, has just started getting used uh, on a regular basis in the last year or so is called car cardiac contractility modulation. And this is, this is a little bit more esoteric to try to explain. But what the principle is, is that they've discovered that if you give an electrical impulse at a at timed in a certain part of the electrical cycle of the heart, you can improve the efficiency of the energy use of the heart, and that that can have a consequence of leading to improved heart function. And so this is a, it kind of looks like a pacemaker, but it's not really pacing the heart um, because it's firing right around the time that the heart would be de delivering uh, an electrical signal anyway. But I just want to throw that out because um, some people already have this, and, and if you have congestive heart failure, you can ask your doctor, hey, would, would CCD help me? And, and if they don't know what that is, you can tell them to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> or listen to this lecture. All right, um, atrial fibrillation, probably the most common heart abnormal heart rhythm that causes problems. And I'm not going to be doing an EKG course here, but I'm going to show you what atrial fibrillation is in, in kind of schematically. So this is a normal EKG. And in a normal EKG, you have a little, a little bump here that represents the electrical activity of the atrium. Those are the upper chambers or accessory chambers, followed shortly after that by a spike that represents the electrical activity of the ventricles. Okay. And so there should be a one-to-one. -one. You've got atrium, ventricle, atrium, ventricle, atrium, ventricle. What happens with atrial fibrillation is the atria are not beating 60 times a minute, 70 times a minute, 80 times a minute. They're beating 300 times a minute. They're beating so fast that they're not really pumping anymore. They are fibrillating. So if you could see the atrium doing this, and suddenly it's kind of doing this, because 300 electrical signals a minute is way too fast for the mechanical uh, part of the heart to kind of keep up with. So it, it fibrillates, but it's atrial fibrillation. Now, if the ventricles fibrillate, that's lethal within seconds. But atrial fibrillation does not lead to ventricular fibrillation. They just have one of those words in common. So two things happen with atrial fibrillation. One is that you no longer see consistent um, bumps right before these spikes. And the other thing is, is that these 300 beats per minute are kind of bombarding, bombarding what's called the AV node, which is the gateway between the atria and the ventricles. And the, and the reason you don't have ventricular fibrillation is the AV node can't conduct 300 times a minute. So it filters out most of these impulses. But even if it filters out two thirds of them, that's still 100 beats that are getting through. So a resting heart rate of 60 becomes 100. Sometimes it only filters out 100 of them. And actually I said 300 times a minute. It can be as much as 400 times a minute. So people can have heart rates of 130, 140, and they're getting through irregularly. So it isn't some organized way where two get blocked, one gets through, two get blocked, one gets through, maybe two get through real quickly, and then another one doesn't get through for, for, uh, for another second or so. And so you get a regular heart rhythm, and you tend to have a fast heart rhythm.
And so atrial fibrillation can, can contribute to congestive heart failure, both because it's too fast, because it's irregular, and because the atrium aren't pumping and therefore not contributing to the cardiac output. There's lots of reasons why atrial fibrillation um, can lead to both symptoms and potentially congestive heart failure. So a lot of people with congestive heart failure and atrial fibrillation, we now do a procedure called an ablation. And you've probably heard of ablation. Ablation means, in a sense, to ablate is to cut. And so an ablation is cutting something. What are they cutting? They're, they're kind of, in the original use of it, it used to be done surgically, and the surgeon would make a little incision that would lead to a scar. And the scar doesn't conduct electricity, and so it was a way of short-circuiting abnormal electrical pathways. Atrial fibrillation is often sustained by extra beats that start right as the pulmonary veins come into the left atrium. There's four pulmonary veins, and they trigger atrial fibrillation. And so an atrial fibrillation ablation will make an electrical burn around each of these to isolate the opening of the pulmonary veins from the rest of the atrium so that the extra beats that are starting there don't get into the atrium. And that's how atrial ablations work to prevent atrial fibrillation. So these are several uh, devices and procedures that are used. Oh, Maya, how much time do we have? I probably have another 15 minutes. So, Greg, we're still, we're still going on, and we're at about 56 minutes right now. So I would say, you know, I just don't want you to be late for your for your things. Oh, no, I'm good. Okay. I'm okay. good, if, if you can all bear with me. <laughs> okay. All right. So other targets for uh, congestive heart failure. Sodium restriction. So sodium acts like a sponge to hold on to fluid. And that's why we tell people to cut their sodium down. You might say, why sodium? I'm retaining fluid, not sodium. But actually, heart failure is a sodium-retaining state that secondarily leads to fluid retention. So we usually limit, try to limit people to two grams of sodium a day. Um, exercise, uh, rehab, very important. People who exercise more are less likely to have congestive heart failure. Vaccinations, it's important. Um, you know, we're, we're, when they talk about vaccinations and consider this vaccination if you have heart disease, because people with heart disease are at higher risk of developing serious problems if they get the infection that the vaccination is preventing, people with heart failure are in that category. Depression screening. A lot of people with heart failure have depression. Um, it is brought on by having heart failure, but it actually can make the heart failure worse because depression um, affects the brain and the brain affects the body. And so there's kind of this vicious circle. So uh, that's something to be considered. Um, sleep apnea, untreated sleep apnea definitely increases the risk of, of congestive heart failure. And so we ask questions that, that get at whether a person might have sleep apnea, like do they snore or they witness to stop breathing? And there's ways of treating that. And iron deficiency, interestingly, anemia is not good for heart failure. But iron deficiency, even without anemia, is not good for congestive heart failure. And they've done studies where they've found that if you have iron deficiency, giving iron infusions to boost up the iron stores actually decreases the tendency to symptoms. So these are all other treatment targets for uh, diminished heart function, heart failure. And then there's drugs to avoid, anti-inflammatories. And I hate to say it because there's so few safe drugs for arthritis and, and muscular pain, but unfortunately, Things like Aleve and Motrin, they can cause fluid retention, they can raise the blood pressure, so they're not good for heart failure. Um, alpha blockers, uh, which are most commonly used for, for men for, who have enlarged prostates, uh, are drugs to avoid. Uh, certain calcium channel blockers, like Fetipine, Deltaizin, Verapamil. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details here. We already talked about the Pioglitazone and rosiglitazone, that's actos and, and uh, recivistatin. And another category of, of uh, diabetes medicines, the, the so called gliptins, when they were tested recently, were shown, some of them were shown to increase the risk of congestive heart failure. All right. Um, we talked about now heart failure with diminished heart function. You can also have heart failure with preserved pumping but poor relaxation, 
Um, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I just want to talk about how do we doctors look at this condition and how do we diagnose it. Um, you have to have fairly normal pumping ability, so the ejection fraction is our measure of systolic function. It's the percentage of blood the heart pumps out each time it beats. Normal is not 100%. Normal is 55% or more, and 50 to 55% is considered low normal. So if you have essentially intact pumping ability, and you also have an elevation of this BNP or pro-BNP, and you have signs of fluid retention, that can help make a diagnosis of diastolic heart failure or FPEF. And we also use some scoring systems that are based on the exam, based on demographics, and based on echo findings. So it's kind of complicated, but just so you can see that, that it's not always an easy diagnosis to make. It's a lot easier if you just see that the heart's not pumping well. If the heart's pumping fine, you have to tease things out a little bit more to decide if the symptoms are from congestive heart failure or not. But there is now treatment for HEFPEF, and, um, and again, that's heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. That's where that term comes from. Um, we didn't until recently have things that were proven to be effective in this condition. All the drugs I was telling you about in the previous slide were, were proven effective for reduced ejection fraction. That's why it's called HEFREF. Um, and, and it took a while to find things that also work with HEFPEF. The most, the most proven is actually the newest, which are these SGLT2 inhibitors. So they're the, they're the first line therapy. And then beyond that, we give people diuretics, get rid of fluid. And if they still have symptoms, other medicines that are also used for HEFREF, but are beneficial for HEFPEF are the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists like a flarinone and, and spironolactone, the ARNIs like, well, right now there's only one in Tresto, and ARBs like Losartan and Valsartan. So we do have options for this condition now. And really the same targets for HEFREF are true of HEFPEF, but I added weight loss to that. So weight loss is listed here and it wasn't listed in the other. HEFPEF is, if, if you look at what some of the biggest predictors are of getting HEFPEF as you get older, it is being inactive and carrying around too much weight. So the opposite of that really helps inoculate you against getting HEFPEF. And I'm gonna finish very quickly talking about a particular type of HEFPEF called amyloidosis. I'm talking about it because we now know, well, what we didn't know when I was in training 30 some years ago, that this is a much more common condition than we thought. When I was in medical school in the late 80s and, and in training as a phys physician in the early 90s, we considered this to be a very rare condition. Um, and so it was one of those things where, okay, yeah, I read about this in medical school, but I'm never gonna see it. And it turns out we didn't see it because we didn't look for it. And if you look for it, it's actually pretty common. So I bring this up mainly because if you have congestive heart failure and and you're not responding to therapy, or your doctor says, I'm not really sure why you have it, ask if it's possible that it could be amyloidosis. Amyloidosis is a type of thickening of the heart muscle that is due to deposits of abnormal proteins in the wall of the heart. And so a normal heart looks like this. Amyloidosis hearts look like this, look like that, where it's abnormally thick. Now, most of the time when the heart is abnormally thick, it's thick because the muscle gets thick. But this is not muscle. This is tissue that is, um, that's embedded with these abnormal proteins. And there's two major types of proteins that cause amyloidosis. One of them is caused by blood cells called plasma cells making too much immunoglobulin. And that is most commonly seen in people of multiple myeloma. So we, if we suspect amyloidosis, we look for multiple myeloma. And the other is caused by too much transthyretin being deposited in the heart. And transthyretin is a molecule that carries certain proteins in the bloodstream. Um, sometimes it has a mutated version that tends to link up and form chains that then deposit in the heart and also in other tissues 
like like nerves. Um, but even uh, normal transthyretin, as as we get older, it kind of develops some injuries and doesn't behave the way it should, and it can deposit even in people who don't have a mutation. So these these are the two most uh, these are the two proteins that cause amyloidosis and lead to hepatic diastolic heart failure. And you can we can sometimes see this through what we call speckling on an echo. So you see these kind of bright spots that are kind of the reflection of these protein deposits. Um, on an MRI, you can see it as these white deposits, which you know should it should look dark like this, but you get all of this stuff in there. And that's just another view on the MRI. And who do we suspect amyloidosis in? Well, it tends to be seen at older ages. Um, and we look for in people who have um, have have tef and certain red, red flag signs. And I'm not going to go into all of them, but I tell you this so that you see what your physician might be looking for when they're trying to determine it. There are things we see on the EKG um, that might give us a clue on the echo, on an MRI, on lab work. But the real, real major things that you give a clue are if the amyloidosis is involving the nervous system, people can have sensory motor neuropathy, so peripheral neuropathies, particularly diffuse, not just this leg, but both my legs, both my arms, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, um, autonomic neuropathy. So autonomic uh, nervous system is the part of the nervous system that you don't have to think about. Um, it controls things like the heart rate and controls digestion. So uh, people can have digestive problems. They can tend to have diarrhea. They can have, can have nausea and vomiting. They can have gastric, uh, GU problems, um, genital urinary problems like incontinence and things like that. They can have problems maintaining appropriate blood pressure where their blood pressure tends to drop uh, when they stand up. So none of these are, are proofs of amyloidosis, but they're things that if we hear them and a person has congestive heart failure, we think we should be looking for this. And how do we look for it? Um, we look for these abnormal proteins. So for, am for amyloidosis related to myeloma, we measure these abnormal light chains that are the immunoglobulins that are made by the plasma cells. And for TTR, for transthyretin amyloidosis, we actually have a scan called a PYP scan, a certain type of nuclear scan, that can see signs of these deposits non-invasively in the heart. And then there is treatment. If you have uh, myeloma, treating the myeloma treats the amyloidosis. And now we have drugs for the transthyretin type. Um, Tefamidus is something I've used in several of my patients with, with varying degrees of success. Some people don't have much effect, but I've had people have marked improvement in their symptoms. And then there are other, other new types of medicines uh, that actually interfere with the production of the tr transthyretin, and, um, and these are undergoing trials right now. So the other reason we didn't use to look for amyloidosis is we couldn't treat it, but now we can. We know it's more common, and now we look for it. So in summary, um, we diagnose heart failure with a basic history, physical, and targeted studies. Um, there are definitions of heart failure that we talked about. It doesn't mean your heart has stopped, but just that it's not pumping in the way it should be. Um, and there are different ways of classifying heart failure. There are a lot of different causes, and we've talked about some of the most important ones. And first, we need to treat the underlying cause. And secondly, we need to use medications that can treat all causes, um, as well as lifestyle changes that could be helpful. And finally, if you have HEFPEF, keep amyloidosis in mind. So, so thank you so much. I've got a couple of questions that came in that I wanted to ask before we turn it over to the in-person audience. Um, one was somebody just commented and asked about the stents, the picture of the stents that you had shown. Um, are they the actual size or how big are they typically? So, no, those were blown up. And, what, and, and in the photo, um, it was being put up against a person's thumb. So you can kind of see the relative size based on that. Okay, perfect. All yeah. right. So the average, the average coronary artery is about three millimeters in diameter. So even ex expanded, these stents are about three millimeters. But coronary arteries are different sizes. So we have stents that go up to about four and a half, five. We have little ones that are two, two and a half to try to fit a particular person's vessel. 
Great. Okay. Does dental health factor into CHF at all? Dental health? Mm -hmm. Um. I have to pause there. So I can think of some reasons why it would. Um, people with poor dental hygiene can develop infection on their valves, endocarditis, that can then cause congestive heart failure because the valves fail. And poor dental health is, a, is associated with increased inflammation in the body and the increased inflammation has some indirect effects. It could kind of, through other steps, lead to congestive heart failure. But I wouldn't say there's an, an immediate cause and effect between dental health and congestive heart failure. Okay, great. And if you were to get a specific type of a valve, can you get a different type down the road, or would you would somebody have more than one type of valve placed? So, so the answer is yes, um, but we would obviously want to wait for the valve to fail. In other words, we weren't, we're not going to do a second operation because a person has a valve and says, I heard this other one's better. <laughs> right. But let's say you have a mechanical valve at the age of 60 and it fails at the age of 80. And by the time you're 80, you're having some bleeding issues and you just think, I don't want to be on warfarin anymore. So the reoperation might put in a biologic valve that doesn't require warfarin anymore. Okay. Um, and can, I know we've talked a lot about the ejection fraction today. Yes. Um, what's the number, uh, like what, what numbers do you look at as far as the percentage, I guess? Yeah. It, it, right. If somebody is familiar with what the EF is, right. um, what's normal and then what would you be looking at for somebody maybe that has CHF? Yeah. So. CHF can be associated with any ejection fraction, because and that's what we call HEFPEF, is preserved ejection fraction. So a normal ejection fraction is 55% or more. 50 to 55% is kind of low normal. Under 40% is what we call HEFREF, reduced ejection fraction. And there is a term, HFMR uh, heart failure, mid-range. So if you're between 40 and 50%, you're sort of in between. And those people behave more like people with reduced ejection fraction. So for practical purposes, 50% is our cutoff for determining, are we going down a HEFREF pathway of medicines or are we going down a HEFPEF pathway of medicines? But we don't use the ejection fraction to decide if a person has heart failure or not. Heart failure is a clinical constellation of symptoms and signs, and we only use the ejection fraction to help decide why does a person have it and what are the right things to do to fix it? Okay, great. Is there anything else that somebody should consider, uh, important things that the, your family could do to, and you to help manage your condition if you have CHF? Um, take the medicines that, that are prescribed, um, you know, do the testing to help find reversible causes, and then the lifestyle things we talked about, salt, salt restriction, staying physically active, keeping your weight optimal. Um, those are probably the most important things. Right, so diet and so, Diet, say, exercise. Diet is important. <laughs> kind, okay. of, kind of help all around, right? Right, exactly, it does. Um, I do wanna put up, so if somebody was interested in coming to see you, Dr. Kashkari, and I am putting up on the screen uh, the phone number for Pima Heart and Vascular, it's 520-838-3540, or you can visit pimaheartandvascular.com uh, for more information. Um, so I want to thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to close off with our online audience, and I'll turn it over to, to the uh, folks that are in the room today for any other questions. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much for being here. Sure. Thanks again for joining us today for uh, heart failure. We are gonna have more talks next week um, and we also have a um, Heart Smart Expo. So if you are interested in coming to our next talk, it will be on, sorry, uh, Tuesday, February 13th. It is Eating to Your Heart's Content, so a nutrition talk uh, for your heart health.
Um, so if you'd like to join us again, February 13th at 10 a.m., that will be with Mary Malady from our TMC wellness team. Um, if you'd like the link for that, please give us a call at 520-324-1960. And we'll see you then. Thank you.